if I ask the question, how many of you would want to live life at its best? Most likely, I would get it, just about every hand is raised. And that's good, and that is right, because God created us to live life at its best. It is God's desire for each one of us to live our life at its best. But the question arises of the definition of best. What does best mean? What does life at its best mean? Who decides what is best? And I thought it's better for me to illustrate what I'm trying to say uh, with somebody actually wrote this story. And it's about a young man who went to the beach for vacation. And he took his goldfish with him. He would go every morning and soak the sun, enjoy the surf, and loves life at its best for him. But after a few days of doing that, he began to feel guilty. Here I am enjoying life in the sun and the surf, but Goldie is all by itself there in the condominium. And so one day, out of guilt, he said, I better help Goldie get part of that action. So he said, Goldie, tomorrow you and I are going to get some action. You're going to come and enjoy life at its best just like I do. And so in the morning, he takes Goldie out of the fishbowl, and he wraps it in a washcloth and takes it with him to the beach, and uh, there he puts Goldie right next to him. And he sat in the sun, and he looks at Goldie and says, uh, Now, Goldie, that is life at its best. Live it up. Live it up. And if you say to me, There couldn't be no more foolishness than this, you're right. Why? Because life at its best for that goldfish was not meant to be in the beach, or any fish for that matter, because it will most surely die. It was never intended to be in that environment. It is not life at its best for that fish or for any fish. And if you got that message by now, you really have grasped the whole message of First John, to which I want you to turn now in your Bibles. First John, chapter 1, in this short series of messages, I'm calling it Living Life at Its Best. Life at its best, it is lived when it is lived in the right environment, when it is lived the way God made it to live, the way God intended for it to live. True life at its best, however, has a beginning, has a middle, and has a continuation. And those are my three points. Life at its best. The only way to begin it, that is verses 1 to 4. Life at its best. The only way to sustain it, verses 5 to 7. Thirdly, life at its best. The only way to grow it, verses 8 to 10. The only way to begin life at its best, verses 1 to 4. Let me give you a background first. The Apostle John lived to be an old man. Jesus told him so. In fact, he told Peter in John chapter 21, verse 22, that John is going to live to be an old man. And he did. He lived to be his 90s. And one thing about living long time is that you see things you never thought you're going to see in your life. <laughs> After the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, many of the believers fled Jerusalem, and John was one of them, and he ended up in Ephesus for a period of time. Of course, he was in Potamus where he had this great revelation, the book of Revelation, which we have in the last book in the Bible. But he lived most of his life in Ephesus. But in the church of Ephesus, there was another man by the name of Serenthus. Now, Serenthus originally believed in the gospel message that was preached by the apostle Paul in Ephesus. But then he didn't like the truth of the gospel. He didn't like the teaching of the apostles. He didn't like the fact that Jesus is the only Son of God. He did not believe, did not like the message, the exclusivity of Christ in the gospel message. He did not like the fact that it is only through faith alone one can be saved. So he began to teach new philosophy. He began to teach a heresy, and he split the church in Ephesus. That new philosophy 
was later known as Gnosticism. How many of you have heard of Gnosticism? Yeah, thanks to Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code and, and all this stuff. No, we all know about, the, about Gnosticism. Well, this is the man who started it. And it says basically that Jesus is not God in human flesh because he said the body is evil and therefore God could not become human. And so Jesus, he said, was adopted by God at the time of baptism and he became the Son of God until the, before the cross and then God dumped him. He no longer was the Son of God. Serenthesis to, taught that salvation is a matter of attaining higher knowledge. And the more knowledge you attain, the more salvation you get. And just like what Buddhism teach today. And that is why throughout the epistle of John, John wanted to say, and you notice I said wanted to say, did not, I didn't say said. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to say it for him. He says, what knowledge are you talking about, you silly boy? That's really what he wanted to say. And I'll tell you how. Because his polite way of saying it is he constantly repeating saying, we know, we know, we know, we know. In other words, I was personally with Jesus. I saw Jesus firsthand. I experienced Jesus firsthand. I lived with Jesus firsthand. I have heard Him with my own ears firsthand. I have walked with Him. I laid my head on His shoulder. I know Him. And this mumbo-jumbo that you're coming up with, all this mumbo-jumbo that you're talking about, has nothing to do with reality, has nothing to do with the truth. And later on, of course, some of Serenthus' disciples began to write his teaching, 150 years after Christ. And they will write them, and they will tack the names of the apostles to them. And so they looked like the Gospel of Thomas, and the Gospel of Paul, and the Gospel of Mary, and the Gospel of this, and the Gospel of that. And the apostles have nothing to do with that teaching. They are all fraudulent. And today, the Dan Browns of this world say, that's the truth. And they're trying to sell us a bill of goods. So, here, what John is saying, that there is only one way to begin life at its best. Only one way. Any other beginning is a false beginning. Any other beginning is a goldfish in the sun. Any other beginning will lead to death. And because false beginnings will lead to false ending, and because false beginnings will lead to false destination, and because a false beginning is going to lead to false living, and because false beginning will bring about tragic ends, therefore, listen to what John said, verse 1, 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard and seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the Word of God and the Word of life. As if to say, who are you going to believe? This babbling idiot? Now, John didn't say that. Who are you going to believe? This babbling idiot who have never seen or experienced the living Lord Jesus? Or my word of testimony of eyewitness of a life lived with Him? That He is the only giver of life at its best. Who are you going to believe? this philosophical mumbo-jumbo, or the one who experienced everything firsthand. And that's what Jesus himself said. Listen to John 17, verse 3, the high priestly prayer when Jesus was praying. Jesus' own words, listen carefully. Now this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Life at its best has only one rightful beginning, believing that Jesus Christ alone can save you eternally. That is the beginning, but it's only the beginning. How does it begin? Verses 3 and 4. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. Why? So that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And why? Verse 4, so that you may have real joy. Listen to me. Joy is born, not bought. All the money in the world cannot buy you joy. Joy 
produces happiness, not the other way around. Joy is not dependent on your circumstances. Life at its best. The only way to begin it. Secondly, the only way to stay in it. Life at its best begins with light at its best. When you invite Jesus Christ to come into your life, He lights your life. And you must be willing to let Him put His searchlight into every corner and area and department of your life. But look, let's be honest. You know and I know that that's not easy. You know and I know that there are areas in our lives and we say, Lord, you can shine the light on all these areas, especially the public me, but, you know, there's an area here that I really don't want you to touch. Or if he shines the light, you kind of try to shield it. You know what area it is. I know what area in my life. You know what it is. Deep down, we resist the shining of the light in certain areas of our lives. Deep down. And when that happens, what you're doing, you are depriving yourself of the joy that can give you life at its best. You are not know what it's like to dig our heels and say, not that area, Lord. Do everything else except this one, Lord. Which reminds me of a story that's well known in the Middle East uh, about the Bedouin who got hungry in the middle of the night. So he got up, lit a candle, and uh, grabbed some dates that he had there in the corner of his tent. And so he took the first date and put it near the candlelight, and he saw this big worm just looking at him, you know. So he said, well, obviously I can't eat this one. So he tossed it out. He got another one. And he was about to eat it, looked at it close to the light of the candle, and he saw this huge worm coming out at him. So he tossed that one out. Well, before long, he thought he's going to, go hungry and not going to eat any of those dates because every one of them has a worm. So what does he do? What every respectable man does? He let the candle out and ate the dates. <laughs> Worms and all. Listen. Verse 5. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim we have fellowship with the light, that's Him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. In other words, he's saying, we're going to eat the worms. <laughs> Verse 7, but if we walk in the light, as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, purifies us, or keeps on purifying us, or keep on cleansing us from how many sins? All, All our sins. Not just some of them. You know, John loves to begin with the beginning. In his gospel, he starts, in the beginning. <laughs> and here in the epistle, he starts, first verse, which was from the beginning. He loves to begin with the beginning. Why? Because at the beginning of the creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Why? Because without light, there can be no plants, there can be no animals, there can be no growth, there can be no activities, there can be no beauty, there can be no sustaining of creation, there can be no life at all without light. All of creation owes its existence and its sustenance upon light. And in the same way, John is saying that Jesus, who is the light of the world, does not only give life at its best, but his light is the only way that his children can live in joy and in power, can be sustained and strengthened and have victory over sin in the midst of temptation. Far from being afraid of the searchlight coming into your life and pointing some areas that you don't want, far from being afraid, you should welcome it, you should invite it, you should delight in it. Because when the light shines, darkness gets out of the way. When light shines, reality will sit in. When light shines, truth will dwell in you. When His light shines, gloom and doom and depression and discouragement all going to get out and disappear. But the question is, how do I know that I'm regularly 
walking in the light? How do I know that His light is helping me cleanse things that need to be cleansed in my life? And here it gets difficult. Here's where it really gets hard. <laughs> John said, by having love for others. Love for others. Yeah, I love everybody, Michael. Just, you know, but don't, don't bother me with that. Yeah, I love everyone. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Don't run. <laughs> Hold your horses. Hold your horses. The main thing that's going to keep a child of light in darkness or going through a dark patch, the main thing that is going to keep you from experiencing the fullness of joy, the main thing that will keep you from living life at its best is the carrying of bitterness in your life, is the holding on to grudges in your life, it's the harboring of sin. It is the cherishing of sin. It is the unconfessing of sin. It is the hiding of sin in your life. It's going to keep you from walking in the light. Therefore, you may not lose your salvation, but you lose your joy. You may not lose your salvation, but surely you're going to lose your reward when you continue to walk in darkness, when you continue to harbor what you're harboring. I want you to listen to me, please. I had numerous people who have come to me through the years and would say something to the effect, I feel terrible, Michael. I, I, I am more conscious of my sin right now than before I became a believer in Christ. I feel bad. I feel terrible. You know, my response is, you should rejoice. The fact that you are conscious of sin in your life is a clear indication that you are walking in the light. Before Christ, you were dead and you were unconscious to sin. But now... You're no longer in the grip of sin. You did not know what light looks like, but now you do. And once you do, once you experience life at its best, once you begin to experience walking in light, now you know what it's like to go through dark patches in life. So you rejoice, not feel morbid or disappointed. It's good news. It's good news. That should not depress you, child of the living God. It should encourage you. Life at its best. The only way you begin it. Secondly, the only way you sustain it. Thirdly, the only way you grow in it. When the light of Christ shines in your life and in my life, we become conscious of sin. That's half of the good news. Here's the other half. The other half of the good news is that there is only one way to deal with that consciousness of sin. Only one way. And that is to confess it. Look at verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth in us. Ah, uh, but if we confess. He didn't say if we confess or if we do this and if we do. He didn't give you three other four options. One option. If you confess, meaning that's the only way. There's no other way of dealing with sin. You know, through the years, Christians have offered all kinds of ways to deal with sin. I heard people teach the way to deal with sin is full surrender. I heard others teach the way to deal with sin is you receive a second blessing. The way you deal with sin is brokenness. The way you deal with sin is the release of the Spirit. The way you deal with sin is experiencing the exchange life. And once you exchange your sin for Christ's holiness, you become holy and you don't sin. Oh, wait a minute. Look what John said. He said, don't delude yourself. A self-deluded person is the saddest one of all. It's like the guy who literally turning purple and yelling from the top of his voice, saying, I am not losing my temper. He said, don't delude yourself. 
That's what the Gnostics were doing. They were deluding themselves. And said, the body's evil, but I'm okay. I'm fine on the inside. I'm, and the more knowledge I get, the better I become. No, 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 no. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful, He is just, and He will forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What's that verse mean? And you hear it quoted a lot. <laughs> as, as often the case, there are always two extremes. You got the one extreme People said, yeah, yeah, yeah. It means just uh, confess your sins and, and then get on with your sin. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you met some of those. Dial John 1, 1, 1, 9 and move on. Just keep living the way you live. God, forgive me my sins. It's over. And then, of course, you get the other extreme. Those who beat themselves up over sin. Beat themselves up. I mean, they're constantly in remorse. They're constantly in guilt. And they never move from that point. They sit there in that morbid state. And they think that's spiritual. Listen to what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther said, Most Christians have enough religion to feel guilty for their sin, but not enough to enjoy life in the Spirit. I want to say amen belongs here. So what is confession? Here's what John is saying to us. It's a recognition that a particular action or inaction or an attitude, or a thought, or behavior is morally wrong in the eyes of God. And to accept personal guilt, personal responsibility for that wrong. But that's not all. Then you must follow with a specific request of confessing that sin, asking for the Lord's forgiveness of that sin, and then His empowerment to have victory over that sin. That's why He said, identify the wrong, Take personal responsibility. Ask God for mercy and grace to deal with both. That's as far as offense to God is concerned. And offending another person works the same way. Works the same way. Acknowledging, confessing, and asking for forgiveness. So what does God do in response to this heartfelt confession? John said, because God is true to His Word, because God is true to His character, because God is true to His promises, because God is faithful to His nature, you can be confident that your sins are forgiven and that you are cleansed and that you're being restored. Why? Because you have a lawyer in heaven that all the money in the world could not afford. You have an advocate in heaven. You have a patron in heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ is constantly interceding on your behalf to God the Father. That is why. You have a very important person in heaven who is speaking on your behalf. I don't want you to forget what I'm going to tell you. Listen carefully. The work of Jesus Christ is both finished and unfinished. His work as the high priest who offered the perfect sacrifice for your sin and mine, that work is finished. But His being an advocate who is interceding on your behalf, that work is not finished. As a redeemer, His work is finished. But as a restorer, His work is not finished. As a Savior on the cross, His work is finished. But as a sustainer on the throne, his work is not finished. As a justifier, his work is finished. But as a sanctifier, his work is not finished. We have an advocate with the Father. If you'd like to learn how to know God in a personal way, ask for the booklet, Finding the Joy You've Always Wanted. It will tell you of God's love for you and explain how to experience his forgiveness.
If you have a personal relationship with God and you're interested in walking closer with Him, the booklet Seven Steps in Your Faith Adventure will help guide you into a deeper fellowship with your Heavenly Father. Ask for your free booklet. 